Welcome and good afternoon to this British Malaysian uh, Society uh, webinar. Um, our, all the teams here with our expert uh, presenters and just people logging in now so I can see the amount of participants uh, increasing. And Stuart, my great glamorous co-host, if you wouldn't mind just moving the slide back one, please. And then we'll see what we have here. Let's see. Okay, so we're here, we're live. Um, I'm very much uh, pleased to, to see you. Uh, my name is David Stringer Lamar. I'm a, me a member of the executive committee. You'll see me moving my head around because I'm the, the technical host at the moment, which means I get the exciting, stressful bit um, to do. Um, but ably assisted by Stuart, and I'm just moving my head between the two different uh, screens. Okay, so what we have for, you, uh, for us all today is an excellent uh, event looking at uh, the importance and all aspects really um, of, of branding. So just to let you know, of course, um, that today's session is being um, uh, recorded, um, so you're aware of that particular feature. If you look towards the, the bottom of the screen, you'll see there's a, a chat function there. So do let us know where you're, you're dialing in from um, today. So I'm in just having a look through the window, sunny uh, London. So do let us know uh, where you are uh, at the moment. Um, you'll also see um, there's a Q&A button down there at, at the bottom. Now, within this, we've got a Q&A section um, at uh, towards the end. So please do post your questions in there. And there's also a voting function. So meaning that if you like a question, then please do vote for it. They'll actually start to raise it up so we can see what the most popular ones are. So it's very interactive in that particular uh, manner. Um, we're also going to have a series of polls um, as we, we go through um, the, the, the session. Um, I'm going to launch the first one now, in fact, so let me just bring it up. So brandings, your thoughts. I'm launching the poll now. You can see it on your screen. So first one there, have you thought of the importance of branding? No or yes, please answer that. Are you interested in improving your business branding? No or yes. So if you wouldn't mind uh, having a look at that one um, in there, that would be most, most good and most useful for our experts will be here. So whilst you're doing that, I'm now going to show you, you can see it here on the screen, just like a shopping channel. This is the new BMS tie, just arrived hot off the press. As you can see it, uh, Mason, our chairman, has already sent it around. This is the original, the first tie, and already we're, we're getting some orders in. There's a limited number in there, uh, so make sure that you get, get your order in. Um, before they're all gone and we have to order a second a second batch. You'll notice how excellently it goes with the white shirt I'm wearing. <laughs> okay, that was an additional uh, aspect. Okay, let's see what we have. Then I'll give you five seconds more for the poll. So five, four, three, two, one. I'm ending the polling there. Uh, let's see what we have. Have you thought of the importance of brand? Well, 100%. Thank goodness for that. Otherwise, you'd be in the wrong place. Are you interested in improving your business branding? Well, look at that. 7% say they're not interested. So we'll see uh, if that's changed or not uh, by the end of this session after they've listened um, to our experts. Okay, if I may have the, let me see it, stop sharing the results. Now, if Stuart, I may have the next slide, please, as you're working complete technical harmony. And it's my great pleasure, of course, to welcome our stunning chairman, May Sim Lai, ABE DL to address us. Chairman. Thank you, David. Members of the British Malaysian Society, ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome to our webinar on branding. There are many people who still do not appreciate the importance of branding and the numerous benefits that managing branding well brings. I have a personal brand. You each have a personal brand. BMS has a brand. And those of you who are in business have developed your business brand. Do you know that the practice of branding 
actually goes back to the times of ancient Egyptians. In before um, it's 2700 BC, when branding was used to differentiate one person's cattle from another by means of a distinctive symbol burned into the animal's skin using a hot branding iron. Nowadays, branding is most often associated with differentiating different products. So why do you choose to buy McDonald's instead of Burger King? So do you drive a Ford motor car or a BMW uh, or a Rolls Royce? And it all depends uh, on the power of their branding and also the money in your pocket. So um, people choose to bank with uh, Lloyd's or Barclays uh, or NetWest or HSBC because they know the brand and they trust the brand. So we are very fortunate this afternoon to have with us two speakers who are vastly experienced in branding. Firstly, we have Sabilla Din, who is the founder and the chief executive of Din Consultants, uh, who is vastly experienced uh, on the strategic marketing aspects of branding and also how to commercialize good ideas. Uh, Sabilla is the chair of the financial services group of IOD City and lately she has been doing a lot of work for the World Bank uh, in Africa and in some of the uh, MENA countries. So Sabila will set the scene for our next speaker, Professor Phil Cleaver. Phil again is another expert in branding. He is a multi-award winning graphic designer, author and artist. He's internationally known uh, and Phil has been working with Angel Wong, his associate in Kuala Lumpur, on a branding um, exercise for one of the Malaysian banks which has now been completed. I think Phil has also been requested to look at uh, a Malaysian identity that will encapsulate all the different cultures. I think that is still work in progress, but it sounds extremely exciting. So thank you to both our speakers for uh, joining us today. And at this stage, may I hand over to Sabila Din. Sorry about that. I was just trying to unmute myself. Um, thank you very much, Maysim. Uh, welcome, everybody, and a delight to have you all joining today. So in my section, I'm really going to talk about why brands matter more than ever and just set the scene for Phil, uh, talking about what is a brand, why is it important, and what do you need to consider to build a brand today? Because to create a distinctive brand identity, you have to first understand your brand. It has to be salient, meaningful, and different. So before I go into the presentation, David, if I could have the first poll question, please. Doing it now. Thank there you. We go. What is a brand? Okay, ladies and gentlemen, so uh, there is your, your questions. What is a brand? Which of the following do you associate with brand? And allegedly, this is multiple choice. You can tick more than one. Um, so uh, here it comes up for you now. So um, select which ones that you uh, are comfortable with, that considering your mind is what is a brand? Thank you very much. And I'll give you, oh, let's be mean, eight seconds. So eight, seven, six, five, four, three, Two, and I'll make a very long one as, the, as they come in. Great. Thank you. 
fingers crossed. And share the results. There we are, Sibylla. Okay, right. So 94% of you talk about it as the image, 63% talk about it in products and features, 57% um, interactions and experiences, and 60% are rational and emotional associations. So let's go to the answer. Uh, if I could have the next slide, please, Stuart. So a brand is, you've got to think of a brand like you think of a person. There's an emotional side and there's a rational association. Products are what manufacturers make and they sit on shelves. Brands are what people buy and they sit in minds. It's the monopoly of the mind that a brand creates and it creates it in three ways. It's, it creates it by being different, by being innovative, by delivering solutions that are relevant, that are salient and off the time. There's another angle, which is how does it make you feel? Mason touched on it. BMW probably makes you feel you've arrived. Uh, if you can afford a Ford and a BMW, you're likely to go for a BMW, depending on where you are in your career journey or your wealth journey. So that's a whole area about how it makes you feel. Now, that was all very relevant up until this day and age. But as we have witnessed, a huge change is taking place in society. And suddenly those material items are just not enough. It, what does a brand do? What's its purpose that goes beyond money, that goes beyond uh, people and products? And I call it the third, fourth B or the fifth B or whichever you want to call it. And that is the public. And by public, we mean the society, the planet that we live in. So having said that, that having put everyone on the same platform with what is a brand, um, I move now into why does this matter? Why does it matter for you to be different? Why does it matter for a company to be innovative? Why does it matter for a, a company uh, to have a purpose? So we could have the next chart, please, Stuart. Okay. Strong brands matter because they contribute to financial returns. They create wealth. A brand value is a dollar amount that the brand contributes to the value of the company. And what you see is the global top 10 brands. You've got Amazon at uh, 450 million, billion, sorry. Apple at 352 billion, Microsoft at 326 billion. So those are the brand values. When you look at the market capitalization, Amazon today is 1.49 trillion, Apple is 1.67 trillion, and Microsoft is 1.5 trillion. So strong brands contribute anywhere between 25% to over 50% of the brand, of the, of the value of the company. A classic one is Nike. If you think about Nike, you think about uh, sports, you think about athletics, but Nike has a purpose, and that's to create a healthy society. And if you look at its brand value and its contribution towards the overall value of the company, it's over 50%. If we look at the Malaysian top brands, as yet there isn't a Malaysian top brand in the top 100 brands. The largest brand is Petrona at about uh, 13 billion, and its market cap, I believe, is 135 billion and it sits just below the top 100 brand. The number 100 brand is Pepsi, and it's about the same sort of valuation. There's huge potential in Malaysian brands to innovate and to say that, because in the past few years, 17 Chinese brands have entered the top 100 table. So if we can go to the next chart, please. So they matter because they contribute. Uh, I think we've gone a bit too far. If we go back to chart number four, please. I'll carry on talking whilst we're getting the right chart up. Why do they matter? Because they're good for investors too. They outperform the market. 
And if you take a portfolio, that's the one. If we take a portfolio of the top brands, you take the share price and you compare it versus S&P 500 and the MSCI World Index, what you'll see is the top 10 global brands grew by 285% in a period between April 2006 and 2020. The strong brands grew 173%, the MSCI grew 120% and the S&P 46%. If you then look at the Malaysian brands, they are slightly under the S&P. Now that's the Malaysian top 100 brands that have been bunched, to, sorry, Malaysian top 10 brands that have been bunched together in average form. But when you split the brands apart and see how they perform against the S&P, brands such as DIGI, uh, Maxis are actually on par with the S&P. So that suggests to me, and I'm not close to the brands in the country, it suggests to me is that they are innovating and differentiating as well. If I could have the next chart, please. And I'll carry on talking, which is another reason is that strong brands are resilient. They better withstand market volatility. So in the period February 14 to March 20th, 2020, the MSCI World Index dropped 75%. The S&P 500 dropped 51%. The strong brand portfolio dropped 42%. And the top 10 portfolio of brands dropped 37%. Now we haven't put up the chart for the top Malaysian brands, but when I did the analysis of the top 10 Malaysian brands versus the S&P and it dropped about just under 20%. Now that could be a fact of emerging markets that's also coming in. So there are, that's an interesting way to think about brands, but how do they achieve these results? They achieve them because they disrupt, they innovate and adapt to deliver relevance. I go back to the space in the mind if all brands looked alike and offered the same thing and the identities were pretty bland, um, that brand's not going to be at the forefront of your mind. Uh, I'll leave Professor Phil to pick up further on the differentiation. How do you create a strong, different identity? But I started by saying that to create the identity, the brand, you have to understand your brand. What does it stand for? What is the value it's offering? And I've just put up a chart to kind of outline, if I could have the next chart, please. What are the things that brands have to think about now in the COVID world, given that society has changed, customers have changed, consumers are changed, they're continuously changing. And we don't quite know where it's all going to um, map out. But there are two very important dynamics that every brand and business needs to think about. As Mason was talking about the history of branding, in the industrial age, brands used to be about products. We then went into the 80s and the 90s and 2000, and it was all about the individual and what it said about the individual. Right now, there's the planet and the public that are key. It's a great opportunity for a company that is an innovator and a disruptive to, to take the space because at the moment, everyone is crying out for an organization that behaves responsibly and stands for something. Trust and responsibility are key attributes now and brands that have that contribute about 9% of the brand equity. Responsible corporate behavior, sustainability, inclusivity, diversity, racial equality, contribute about 60% of brands that have this do 60% better than brands that don't. And, and in a world where everyone is looking for leadership and who don't, don't know who to trust, a brand that comes along and stands for something, is strong, is differentiated, 
has a good platform to build a leadership position. So how does it build that leadership position? And that's by understanding some of the changes that are happening in society and where it wishes to play. One thing's for sure, we're in the era of no return. During the COVID period, brands that have done well are those that have helped us navigate life. That's why Amazon, um, uh, eBay, all those brands, the technology brands that are, that are really across the world are the ones that have done really well. Amazon's done well as well. So these are some of the things or some of the, the considerations to take account. Brands that help customers navigate life can have an opportunity for differentiation. In the case of banking, the industry that uh, I do a lot of work with, I should make an interesting ob observation that whilst I was talking about the top brands, the point that I, I omitted to uh, make was that the top brands contribute between 25 to 50 percent of the value of the company. In financial services, most financial brands contribute between 10 to 15 percent. So again, there's a a lot of room for innovation there. And that innovation comes through by understanding that we're entering an era where a lot of people are going to be worried about how they're going to manage their finances. How are they going to put food on the table? Will they have enough income? So that, there's an opportunity there, value shopping. Uh, opportunity for brands to think about incentive programs, loyalty programs to create ideas and commercialize them. Health and safety are key. We're in a society where pulling together and sharing is quite important and small and local. It's interesting to note that the American Express campaign that is running at the moment on radio is all about supporting the small local retailers. We can't ignore the fact that AI is here. And one of the key things is how do human and machine interact? and produce a world that is better for all. I use the word, word better for all. And in that comes data and the use of data. How is data going to be used for the benefit of the customers? And what are the ethics? Again, a strong opportunity to, for a brand to come along and set the standards in data ethics and therefore grab the space for differentiation is going to be key when reimagining and transforming for the future but that involves staying close to customers and aligned to how they live their lives using data to give the competitive advantage smart brands are already starting to think about how do they build a customer knowledge center which does leverage data that does use ai that does look at predictive modeling to be enabled to switch messages and also how they communicate with the customers at rapid speed and at real time. For that's the era we're entering and that's what it demands. So if I could go to the next chart, please. So having given you a bit of a flavor of what brands are, what, what strong brands do to achieve the, the position that they have, um, it might be interesting uh, to have in the chat box your answer on what do you think is the Malaysian brand that is best placed to be in the global top 100. And Stuart, if I could ask you to go back to chart four so that the Malaysian brand names are up. That's the one. So if you could please put into the chat column which of these, from these 10 brands, who do you think is likely to be in the top 100. And I'll start counting 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. And I'm see seeing from the comments, we've got Petronas, we've got Public Bank, we've got Air Asia, we've got Maybank. Is anyone else I've missed? I think I've captured most of the brand. Maxis. 
Um, let, let, let us share with you our predictions as to who we think are going to be in, or rather I think is going to be in the top 100. Um, the ones that have great potential, yes, Maxis is one, and the other one is DIGI. And the reason why I'm making that comment is because remember when I went back quite earlier and I did the share price analysis and I showed how the top 10 brands had behaved versus the S&P and the MSCI, Maxis and DIGI are the two brands that are neck on neck with the S&P. So I think a little bit of innovation and these brands can just tip over and, and then have the platform to excel in the top 100. And this time next year, if Mason invites me back, it'll be interesting to see if these predictions have, have actually turned into reality. But um, that, that's, those are our thoughts. Um, thank you very much for listening. And I think at this point, I shall hand over back to David, right? Yeah, great. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Sibylla. Uh, terrific. Um, keep those uh, comments coming into the chat section so we, we can see what your views are on there. And of course, remember, uh, we will have the questions and answers. So if you do have some questions, uh, do put them into the, the Q&A um, facility. Um, we, and now uh, we're going to move over to Professor uh, Phil. So uh, Stuart, if I can ask you to stop sharing your screen. Terrific. Thank you very much. And uh, Professor Phil, over to you, sir, for screen sharing. Hello. Um, this actually is the elef elephant for the Type Archive, which won a, a DNA D, which is like an Oscar in the design world. And we're not moving. Right. Sorry, you don't seem to be got to freeze. Sorry, technical hitch. Is it moving? No. Ah, right. Basically, who I who am I? What do I do? I um, was brought up in the East End of London, and I've worked in the design industry for 43 years. This is me when I was five years old. I was given two live monkeys and a parrot. The street photographer took the picture and sold it to my mum. Uh, I still love animals, but I now go around the world and I eat them. That's in Malaysia. <laughs> I, um, I do a lot of commercial talks. This is at the largest design conference in, in the world, in China, uh, last November. I designed Pearson's. I also designed the Visa logo. Wherever I go, I normally get written up in the local, local magazines. Um, this is in, in Hong Kong. I have no idea what it says. Um, this is actually in the Sunday Mail in uh, Malaysia. So the largest brand I ever redesigned was Visa. I drew the V, I, and the A. And Viv Thomas, a friend of mine, he drew the S because I'm not very good at curves, but I'm getting better. Um, we realigned all of Visa's brands, including Plus, that's in Cambodia. Um, this is what's happening a bit in branding at the moment. They're all beginning to look the same. Uh, if you look down here, Google, Airbnb, Spotify, and Pinset, all basically looking like Helvetica. So a lot of the brands are merging. Um, five years ago, I wrote a book about what they didn't teach you in design school. So it's what you need to know when you leave. Um, and it sold out five or six times in America and England, and it's become very big in China. I was then asked to write a book about branding for China. And one of my things I bang on about in design is you can't design a solution for a piece of communication if you don't know what you're defining it for. So this is the book which is in the process at the moment, which is how to build a brand identity system. The basic idea of a book is to make yourself able to simple step-by-step -step approach on how to build a brand. It takes the myth and mystery out of the branding process and replaces it with a good deal of straightforward common sense. Common sense seems to be the least common thing in the world. Benchmarks is all about having a set of six or eight words which encapsulate the essence of a brand. They should form a set of qualities by which you can judge any visual communication by. 
They define an organization's DNA, its positioning and its compass by which to navigate by. It's a level of quality that you can be used as a standard against which to compare any brand communication by and the first building block in how to build over the brand. Because if you don't know what you're building, you can't really build it. Once you have the benchmarks and you are brave enough to stand by them, it's design that ignites these words into life, not strategy. The strategy is actually the benchmarks. The branding process has a, a straightforward, simple stage-by-stage -stage approach. First stage is research and familiarization, where the designer has to understand enough about the organization or brand before it can do anything. It then needs to form from that analysis a design brief and a set of benchmarks. From the benchmarks, you, have a, you begin to design the initial concepts. Then you develop those concepts uh, into a great, greater, so you end up with three concepts. You then take those into what I call destruction testing, which is where you do design development. Then you have to produce all the digital artwork, guidelines and implementation. And one of the most important things is communication of change. When we're talking about benchmarks, we're talking about words which convey things which aren't like how you do business, like everyone wants to be very efficient, it's transparent. They're more emotive keywords, more like informative, they're, they're aspirational words. It gives a client a way of articulating in the visual world. So if a client isn't very good at visual world, how do you actually tell your PR company what to do? How do you tell your architect how you want your headquarters building built? What, how do you do reception? How do you do interiors? All of this can be answered by coming back to the benchmarks. So luckily Nike came up already, but legend has it when the chief exec of Nike, Phil Knight, first saw the swoosh with branding. He had read the brand qualities and the benchmarks and he wasn't, he wasn't very happy, but he said, I don't love it, but maybe it'll grow on me. And it's become one of the most visually strong brand logos going. I mean, the Apple symbol is exceptionally well known, but it didn't, if it hadn't had a bite out of it, it would never have communicated knowledge. So the point of it, whatever you design has to communicate what you want it to communicate. I often and have come up with in the past having to, clients insist you have unique as one of the benchmarks. Um, and it basically, normally when you show clients what unique looks like, uh, they run a mile. Um, but in the 1980s, when I was at Wolf Olin's, we changed the name of the organization finance to industry, which is the largest source of finance capital in the world, or was. We changed it to investors in industry. And the main benchmark they wanted was unique. And I am very dyslexic and I can't spell. So I actually wrote free I on my timesheet. And that's how that actually brand started. Amy, um, when I set up Et Al and before that, we did Cardiff City Council. And this is a list of their benchmarks. Uh, it was a hung council and they wanted um, a dragon, but at the same time to be caring and sensitive. And if anyone's ever met a dragon, they're probably not caring and sensitive and human. But we drew the dragon in such a way, it was calligraphic. So it puts the human touch back into the dragon and the corporate colours are the colours of a Welsh flag. And Cardiff has the only seated dragon in Wales on the seat of power. And it went on all the dust carts and everything. I was asked to do an Icelandic bank, again, which wanted unique in it. Um, and it had to be unique, modern, but linked back to lands about the main parent bank. And this is actually their symbol. And it comes to me, land of fire and ice. I had an art gallery in Edinburgh who wanted a symbol, which was unique. Um, they wanted to get across, they were from unique, Edinburgh, modern art and friendly which is quite an odd set of characteristics. Uh, and if you look at the main roads of Edinburgh on a street map, 
it looks like this. And if you look very carefully, the road, main roads form the shape of a dog, which is friendly, it's unique, and it's very much a symbol. And this was the first year's art catalogue where we took the street names that we put, took the street names out and put in the artist names. I've worked for quite a few law firms. I did the largest merger of law firms in England for Evershed. So I'm the only man to get 201 lawyers to agree on anything. And this law firm, which isn't Evershed, wanted to be perceived mainly as human. So we actually took the two dots on either side of the sea and gave it a human face. And when it was our anniversary, we made them smile. Burton, Burton Menswear was um, a, is a chain of fashion retailers. And they wanted something that was traditionally English with street cred, which had humor and history. So they ended up with a British bulldog wearing sunglasses who is called Montague after Montague Burton. This is a, for a, a group of people which run I, accountants of all IT directors of most of the largest accountancy firms. And their branding had to be bright, lively, friendly, open and agile. This became their symbol, which answers all those qualities, just shows it at the launch, how it works on uh, when they all came back after day one of the conference. It's animated. He looked a bit shocked when he got his invite. Website, then it's their 10th anniversary. It's just a bit of fun on all the balloons at the conference. The building blocks of a brand system is you, like a body, it will work with missing bits, but to have everything working for a brand, it needs a benchmarks. It needs a symbol or a non-verbal way of expressing itself. A name style. The symbol and name style together is the logo. It needs a color palette, a brand typeface, a visual language in which to talk in, a tone of voice, a graphic formatting. So when you, when you get rid of a logo, you still know who it belongs to. And what we're developing more now is brand smell. So every time you go into a bank, um, you have a smell, just say it's lemongrass, but every time you go in, you gradually notice it. Smell can be a stronger memory trigger than visual. And of course, sound. Probably you know your favorite record within two bars or the two bars of East Enders and you know what, what it is, more than the actual logo. So we're now doing brand smell and sound. This is for the Alliance Bank in Malaysia. Uh, their brand essence was uh, at the top and then it, they wanted it backed by uh, the projected qualities. So when you look at where Alliance is, it's mainly blue and red. The majority of the banks are all the same color. The banks all use the same typeface. There's only three basic typefaces. Everything is a derivative from it. Either serif, we've got feet, or no feet, which is sans serif, or traditional, which is in between. Generically, all the banks use a form of Helvetica, uh, so there's no distinction at all. 100% of the competitors use lifestyle photography on their home pages. The bank cards are all basically, if you've covered up the logo, you wouldn't know on the whole what bank it was. 75% uh, of all the brochures use lifestyle photography. 60% of them are campaigns which are lifestyle photography based. So by analysing the competition against the benchmarks, you can come back to three key conclusions. Move towards pastel colour palette, especially if you want to be different use a non-serif typeface and avoid squared up lifestyle photography. What was interesting about Alliance was we had to rebrand the bank, but without changing the logo and symbol. The color palette was to introduce pastels. So we have a diff against the primary was to use a series of pastels, not just two corporate colors. This is from the manual. You can see the graphic formatting of the script down the left. The graphic format is a way of doing something which is very distinctive as a way of communicating and build a brand. So it just shows how it works on the pastels. The strip always contains the Alliance Bank. The visual language. No bank in Malaysia has claimed yet illustration. 
So this start, we were looking at that answering the benchmarks and the style of illustration. This is the part of the manual. This strip is always used to contain Alliance Bank. And again, we dictate the colors, we dictate the length, length, uh, weight of rule, style of illustration, and also uh, how you put cutout photography into it. And it also works for the Islamic um, non-figurative. The typeface, everywhere you go in the world within four seconds, you will have seen Helvetica. So since a symbol head is a triangle, we designed a, a, a font which has got a triangle related to it. It also relates to the same triangle in Chinese, same angles. So that's how we came up with the idea of forming that font. It's part of a manual, it shows some of the different weights. And they've got four different fonts on their computer system. So every time they talk to someone in a very subtle way, they're reinforcing their brand. And again, on social media, how all the bunting works, print ads. And just want to leave you with three things. Always be true unto yourself and always say please and thank you. Terrific. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Phil, and indeed Sibylla as well. I mean, really encompassing there. So ladies and gentlemen, we have five questions uh, in the Q&A. Should you want to vote for them, you, you can, of course, uh, do that. There's been a couple of questions in the chat moved over, um, so, so do put them in there. Some of the bits I was just taking away, brands are accumulations of emotional and rational uh, associations. Brands create uh, value. Uh, Professor Phil, you spoke about the eight-stage process. And I like that bit you mentioned about Nike, about, well, I don't love it, but may I, I may come to, to, to grow me, as it were. And the other bit, clients want unique, but then you show them unique and they run a mile away from it. So I thought interesting uh, observations. I like this idea. I'm, I was also trying to think what the brand smell might, might be for the British Malaysian society. Um, <laughs> but that's probably for, for somewhere else to, to think about that, uh, no doubt. Okay, questions and answers time. So I'm going to the question and answer box. Let's see what we have. So first one up the rank here, uh, the, the top popular one, number three, is to you, Phil. Phil, how do you go about picking the colour of your brand, please? How do you go about picking the colour, please, Phil? The advantage of having the benchmarks is to look at what colour answers the benchmarks. Also, what colour is all the competition using? I think blue is used by nearly every financial organisation in the world. So if you want to be different, if one of the brand marks is different, then you're blue. If one of the brand, mark, brand mark benchmarks is that you want to look like everyone else, then you stay with blue. So the way you choose your colour comes back again to the benchmarks and how you want to position yourself. Great. Everything Perfect. you communicate is controlled, or can be controlled. Excellent. Uh, thank you very much. Sabrina, do you want to make any comments on colour, choosing colours? No. No? Oh, so I said it's all. All covered? Great stuff, thank you. Um, next one up. Oh, here we go. Uh, what do you make of the rebranding of Cadbury? So any comments on the rebranding of Cadbury? Phil or Sibylla, who would like to start? Cadbury. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, I think there's, uh, it, it's always the case, a lot of money spent for uh, revamping the uh, design itself. And I would say that what they've done is they've taken the type value face and modernized it a little bit. I don't they've, know what Phil thinks. Phil? Uh, they've dropped the pint and a half of milk, I think. <laughs> I mean, it's not chocolate in anyone's normal world. It's actually milk with sugar and a bit of chocolate. So I, I'm, I think we should put the milk back in. Great, thank you. Thank you both there. And also definitions of chocolate. So what do we have next one up? Oh, here we go. Uh, Sibylla, uh, if you can start on this one. How do current financial services brands develop trust for the younger generation? Many are too slow to innovate and listen to their customers. So financial brand, FS brands trust the younger generation. Okay. It goes back to my last chart when I said what, what are the considerations and the younger generation are quite concerned about um, more than money. So the planet society, you've seen Greta Thunberg, you know, she's galvanized every teenage lady or, or 
young man wants to be the equivalent activist that she is. So I think having a purpose is very important. Um, that's, that's what does the brand stand for? What is it saying? And, but then on the other side, when it starts developing innovation and solutions, it goes back to understanding what are the problems that the younger generation are, are facing at the moment. Affordability is one, life navigation, um, survival, all of that. They won't have much credit history. So can a bank be innovative at how it looks at credit scoring in order to offer uh, the younger generation the support that they need financially? So I think it's, a, it's like an onion. It's got a number of dimensions. It does first start with what is the purpose and if a bank came out and aligned itself to say the Greta Thunberg mo movement, it will immediately get that airtime with the younger generation, but then it has to deliver it. And it delivers it by the way in which it talks, the way it which communicates, the colors it's used, the solutions that it develops, uh, all those particular elements. So the core idea has to be bigger than the brand itself. It should go across to products, people, planet, um, the purpose itself, and communications. Great, thank you, Sri. Uh, Anything to add, Professor Phil? To... Oh, sorry. Okay, now carry on. Uh, Professor Phil, anything to add? Uh, FS, uh, Financial Services, Trust for Young Generation. No, but the main thing is if you design a brand aimed at your audience, you can walk into trouble. You're better off designing a brand which represents what you want the business to stand for and then go to the marketplace. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, next, so that question was for Marilyn Sweeney. Uh, next question is for Madeline. Um, short bit, I suppose. What makes a brand most successful? Then goes on. Is it the design and logo or how the brand is positioned and marketed? Is it the leadership behind the brand? But the question is, what makes a brand most successful? It's all of those things. All of those things. But I have to say, because I'm a designer, I think on the whole, it must be the design. That's a joke. Oh, no, <laughs> I, I would say it's all of those things. It has to start with the leadership. And the leadership has to have a vision and a kind of uh, paint a picture of where it wants the organization to be. And that is what actually provides the foundations for a good brief. And that good brief is what then people like Phil turn into amazing design. Great. Can I just ask a, a rider question, if I may, um, from both of you? Um, how do you work with clients in this design brief? Because obviously, you, know, you both mentioned they'll want something that possibly they can't have. What's it like helping the client to ask for appropriate things or non-appropriate things or get them to think? Just what's this interaction between marketing types and designers and the client? Um, I think with all of these things, there, ha there is a process that needs to be followed. Um, and then there's also a leap of faith. Um, and I say this because the number of times I've sat around the table and tried to explain that innovation does not mean A plus B equals C. When Van Gogh came up with the sunflowers, he did not sort of sit down and sequentially put all the colors together. However, before that, there is an element of insights that are needed, which then feed into the process of creativity. And those elements are understanding where you wish to compete, what you wish to be, who do you wish to target, what are their needs, and how are you going to meet those needs, and how are you going to create differentiation. So that's the piece of thinking and the strategy that goes on before. Put all that in, and that then gives the foundation. And you have to keep pushing the ideas that come up further and further and further and further and keep asking the question, why? And that's where the light bulb moment goes off. I spend my last life asking why. Sorry? why. I spend my life asking why the hell do you do that? Why do you do that? Um, also, I think it's essential, like at the moment I'm working on a, a bank in Vietnam uh, and I have the biggest problem was explaining to them that I needed to spend at least 10 days going around Vietnam 
with to all their branches. So I would actually understand how their culture worked and how their banking system worked. So I could design. And they said, well, can't you do that by Skype? And I said, no, I can't get a feeling for a country by Skype or Zoom. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you for sharing on that. Uh, next question from Joyce. Can you comment on how important a brand is for a small business, please? So brand and small businesses. It's as important for a small business as it is a large business. And if a small business hasn't got good brand, it won't grow into a large brand. Great. And there's a rider question there. Within that, what elements would you consider most important? Making sure you communicate what makes your business and your brand different from everyone else's. Right. Can I just come in on that and say that uh, Apple once started as a small business? <laughs> and when it started, uh, this idea of understanding where, why you're doing what you're doing and how you wish to shape um, your, ent your category, whether it's category of the world. And... Um, Steve Jobs had uh, a, a great, great, great purpose, and that was to actually shape people's minds. And he that was the why. And it just so happened he did it through the iPad and the iPod and all the various other devices that came out. Um, having said that, having looked at Apple's mission statement at the moment, it's gone back into products and functions. But Apple started as a small brand and what he said was he was in the business of producing tools for the mind that advanced humankind. Mm, and right. Apple, so that's why it's important for small businesses. <laughs> well, I think that's the answer. Thank you both for that. We have two, time for another couple of quick questions. And I've had uh, some votes. So how do you know if, or indeed when, a brand needs updating or changing? Anne is thinking about Starbucks here. How do you know if or when a brand needs updating? I mean, that comes back to, remember when I ended the, uh, amended my bit and I said it's important to have a customer knowledge centre. And the Customer Knowledge Centre does the things that uh, partly Phil was talking about, benchmark yourself against the competitor. So if you take Starbucks, uh, benchmark Starbucks against some of the other, um, uh, you know, franchises, organisations that are coming up. And you can pretty much draw some conclusions. But um, sitting around a boardroom table just talking about the emotional side is not enough. You need to back that by data. And that's where it's important to have the data from your customers to understand their buying behavior, what they're buying, where they're buying, and then to apply a, I mean, now you can do the research so quickly, applying uh, predictive uh, modeling and use of AI to actually look at the brand's preference against the others. And you pretty soon come to the conclusion whether your brand needs refreshing or not. The, hard answer will lie in sales and are sales dropping and if sales are dropping why are they dropping so I, I love think the, yeah i love the logo because it's actually a girl with a dog as a dolphin no one wonders why it does soils coffee yeah good He's, point absolutely yeah. and time time for the last one last question here a quick one, if I may. So UK ASEAN Business Council, uh, thank you very much for the question. What time frame is usually required to create a brand logo? Time frame to create a brand logo? Depends on the size of business. If you know, How much you need to analyze it, how much it needs to be done. Some brands I've done in, in under six months, some have taken a year and a half. Great, excellent, thank you. Um, I think that's all we have time for at the moment, or rather, well, I know that's all we have time for. So fantastic. Thank you, uh, Sabila Jen. Thank you, Professor uh, Phil, um, for that. I have uh, another poll for us here. So let me bring it up for everybody. Uh, number three, post-presentation interest in brand uh, improvements. I'm just launching that now. So particularly for those 7% of people uh, who are not particularly interested in improving their brand for their business, so if you could answer this, please, do you wish to improve your company's brand ranking? Are you interested in building new propositions to build the brand? 
are you interested in creating brand identity? Well, it's terrific. That was, that was the last question, wasn't it? Um, from our friends at the ASEAN Business uh, Council. So that, that's good, our good friends at ABC. So I'll give you five seconds. So five, four, three, two, one. So yeah, lots of stuff there, 92%. Uh, let me just put it here and the polling can show to you. There we go. So you can see 89% uh, improve your company's brand ranking, 11%. Don't care, not interested. And uh, number two, interested in building new proposition to build the brand. Um, yes, the uh, 75, interested in creating brand identity, the most popular big yes there, 96%. Obviously, if you're in that yes category, then do, of course, get in touch with Sabilla Din, Professor Phil, and of course, the British Malaysian Society that just brings all these great experts um, together. Um, it's now, uh, Stuart, could we share the screen again? Uh, Pushing Stuart today, it's his first time of doing this, all the excitement of technical prowess. Let me just get rid of those uh, results. There we go. Brilliant. Well done, Stuart. I would now like to uh, invite a member of the executive committee, Simon Clinton, who's also the founder of Clinton Partnership, which is focused on uh, marketing and founder and very passionate about Save Wild Tigers. Simon, sir, over to you. Thank you, David, and uh, good evening to everyone. Um, I think um, uh, fantastic presentations, you know, on behalf of the BMS and the Executive Committee, um, we would like to obviously thank Sabila Din and Professor Phil for their really insightful and enlightening um, presentations. And indeed, sharing a few really interesting thoughts about the potential future direction uh, for brands in what I guess are pretty challenging times for everyone at the moment. Um, it will be fascinating to see which Malaysian company or maybe Malaysian brands uh, rather than one brand actually make that top 100. You know, will it be Maxis? It would be great to get Sabila back here maybe in a year or two and have a look at uh, who's made the uh, top 100 from Malaysia. Um, uh, from a BMS perspective, it's very exciting to have two um, people like Professor Phil and Sabila that have this brand knowledge in this brand space that have got significant experience of working in Malaysia as well as the UK. It's uh, relatively unusual. I think Sabila, you know, beautifully reinforced one of the huge benefits of a strong differentiated brand positioning, which is that inherent financial added financial value of a brand and those comments about you know a premium of somewhere between 20 and 50 percent for a strong um, distinct brand with a very clear positioning that's sort of backed up by that trust and responsibility piece um, is a really power, powerful motivation I think for those brand owners out there uh, debating how and why and if they should, you know, develop the, their brands uh, further. Um, I love your point, Sabila, about um, brands helping people, helping consumers navigate life. I think that's such a, um, an important point about this balance between rational and emotional values that underpin brands. And of course, this provided that great segue for Professor Phil um, into his presentation. Um, and across with 43 years experience, including the whole visa um, uh, piece, which is pretty impressive, um, coming to developing a really strong standout brand identity is so critical. A brand identity that effectively helps differentiate and provides that distinction in the marketplace is so key. I've, I'm really looking forward, Phil, to seeing your book. I will be one of the first to buy it that outlines your sort of eight step process, sort of underpinned by this element of common sense, which is so often, I think, missing. Um, but um, meeting, yeah, that unique challenge of trying to create unique brands. And it's the ultimate um, goal for every marketeer, and very few obviously achieve that. So um, I think, you know, ending with Professor Phil's sort of mantra about no bland brands, I think probably should be signposted on every marketeer's 
desk moving forward. So yeah, looking forward to your book. So once again, on behalf of the committee, just a really big thank you to you both and um, would love to um, hear from you maybe down the track and see how your pro programs and brand development um, initiatives are developing in Malaysia. So many thanks again. And I'll hand back to, I think, David or Mason. Yeah, that's right, Craig. Thank, thank you, Simon, for that. Terrifically well-delivered and, and very considered thoughts and the idea of bringing them back so they can't escape from the, the BMS. Uh, I'd now like to, to welcome back our illustrious uh, chairman, Mason Lai, A-B-E-D-L. Mason, over to you. Thank you very much, David. What a superb uh, presentation by our two speakers. So uh, what else is coming next? On the 20th of August, we have a, a webinar involving speakers from Malaysia and speakers from here on uh, investment in residential and commercial properties in both countries. And then in the autumn, when the students are back, we're doing an event on our mentoring scheme, an update on that, uh, as well as, uh, as a session on uh, smart networking for career success. And then other projects that we have started and looking into, which will uh, be of interest to you, is that we are looking into holding monthly informal networking evenings uh, on Zoom so that members can engage and get to know each other better. And then particularly for the members who are uh, from Malaysia, because we all miss our food, we are looking into setting up a Makan club. So let me thank all the speakers again uh, and let me thank uh, our technical host David Stringer Lamar uh, and also Stuart Yu and let me uh, thank all those people who've asked questions and uh, finally let me thank all of you for attending. Uh, if you want to join BMS and you don't have to be Malaysian to do that, uh, it takes five minutes if you go onto the BMS website and sign up. So thank you all very much indeed and look forward to seeing you at the next BMS event. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mason Lai. Thank you everybody uh, for joining. And personally, thank you to Stuart who, uh, who holds my hand and gets me through all these sessions. A great first um, session and hopefully those people who are not members of BMS will soon be able to. And you can also get the new BMS shy. There we go, at the beginning and at the end. Ladies and gentlemen, that's it. See you at the next one. Thank you very much and goodbye.